Hello everyone, my name is The Fox. In this video, we're going to be doing an in-depth review on IENEO's latest device, their Air 1S. This is the updated model from their old Air, so we are still having that same 1080p OLED screen that made that famous, but we're now rocking AMD's latest 7840 here. We're going to talk a little bit on specs, but the one thing that I want to say a little bit clearly is come in a little bit closer. If you're looking for a PC gaming handle device that has OLED on it, you're going to look no further than this device. This is going to be the only device that has the latest AMD chipset in it that has OLED in it. So if that's all you were looking for, you can pretty much stop the video now. However, if you wanted something that was a little bit more in-depth in this review, let's get into it. Jumping right into the specs, the most important part that we're going to be talking about is that the iNeo Air 1S features the AMD 7840U. On the CPU side, this features 8 cores and 16 threads of AMD's latest CPU architecture, Zen 4. This CPU architecture is an absolute monster if you wanted to get absolute peak CPU performance, except no substitutes. Accompanying the 7840U is the 780M iGPU. This is the GPU component of the 7840U. It features 12 CUs that go up to 2.7 GHz. For all intents and purposes, this is overkill. We do not have enough memory bandwidth to actually support this raw power, but it is a tremendous amount of power on this little package. RAM options are 16 or 32 gigabytes of LPDDR5X at 6400 mega transfers. It is unclear yet if there will be a BIOS update from iNeo that will support 7500 mega transfers. It should be supported right now. At the moment, we can only report on 6400 mega transfers that is on this device. It does feature a full 2280 NVMe slot. iNeo themselves will support selling up to a 4 terabyte stick included. Naturally, the other standout feature on this device is the 5.5 inch 1080p. AMOLED screen. It is an inverted portrait display, meaning that it is 270 degrees inverted. It is native portrait, so it scans out from top to bottom. Taking high frame rate video of the panel itself, it does look like it does use PWM or pulse width modulation to attenuate the brightness of the panel itself. So if you are susceptible to PWM, you may need to take a second look into this device. It does have Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2 Brought to you by Intel's fantastic AX210 wireless chipset. This is a fantastic wireless chipset and one of my favorites. You're going to have no problems with this chipset. There are two different versions. There is a thin model. This model I honestly don't recommend if you're just someone that's really fascinated about a super thin small device. I would not personally recommend it. There are heat considerations on a thinner device. Also, you're going to have a smaller battery. The thin model weighs 405 grams while the regular model weighs 450 grams. Arguably, there isn't that big of a difference here, and I would really argue that you should avoid the thin model, and we're going to be taking a look at thermals and why that matters so much, and having a thinner model is actually going to have that heat radiation broadcast out further to the shell in a more drastic manner than having more surface area on the normal model. So again, this is just really briefly that we're talking about this. We're going to get a little bit more in-depth as we talk a little bit more. Let's go on talking about the next steps. Before we get into the more meat and potatoes part of this review with the benchmarks and thermal imaging, as well as the build quality and the controls themselves, I briefly wanted to talk about Aya Space 2. This is Aya's newest app that tries to bridge the gap of making a handheld device without a keyboard and mouse work wonderful on a Windows operating system. Now, for what it's worth, I'm a big fan of what the Aya Neo team has done with Aya Space 2. One feature that has been recently updated is the kill function. This is something that is similar to what the Steam Deck does when you want to exit a game. You can just quickly bring up the Aya Space app and just press the close application and it will instantly close whatever is the foreground application in the game. This works absolutely fantastic and I tested this on a lot of different games over the seven days that I've been working on this review and it worked absolutely perfectly every time. This is a killer feature that is something that is absolutely mandatory on a device that has no keyboard or mouse and the iNeo team really killed it here. While I have talked about the iSpace 2 app in a more defined manner in previous videos, I wanted to kind of quickly highlight what it does really well in this video as well. We're also going to be talking about it a bit in the controller review portion of this video. However, I do want to highlight that it is super easy to control the TDP in the latest iSpace 2 with just a quick intuitive slider that it has on the screen. The only thing that I would say that I wish that the iNeo team does, and perhaps it will get updated, is that it would lock the controls to the iSpace app itself because the controls will actually translate to the game that is running in the background. So that is one thing that I wish that they get around to. But again, it's been up being updated almost daily now. So I hope that is on the list for the iNeo team to tackle in a little bit. Before we get into benchmarks and trying to understand where performance looks like on this particular device and how you should try to gear TDP on this device, because I have some very specific recommendations on that. And we're going to show you what that means in just a second. I thought at first that we would show the thermals of the device itself. What we're looking at here is the iNeo Air 1S running portably for 30 minutes at 20 watt TDP. 
Now, what we're looking at here, you can see that there's a heat source from two different locations. There is from the heatsink fan area, you can see where the fan is letting out a lot of heat, but you should also notice that the battery itself is dissipating a ton of heat. And that is because the battery itself is heating up and it is adhered directly to the plastic and thus that heat radiation is spreading out to the outer plastic as well. This is an area where I don't actually recommend running the device at 20 watt while in a handout site. You will have actually really bad battery life at 20 watt. You're gonna be looking at close to an hour of battery life. At 15 watt, that's really the max that you should be going on this particular device. And that's really where the device really starts to really shine. But it should be evident here that 20 watt and 25 watt mode should really only be reserved for while the device is plugged in and the device's battery is at 100%. When you do that, the battery will be disconnected and you will only be running off of mains. Then the battery will not be getting hot. And at that point, you're gonna be able to play 20 and 25 watt. I wanna make a clear distinction here that if you are running portably, that battery is going to be discharging a lot of heat. However, if the battery is at 100%, feel free to run at 20 watt or 25 watt as that heat radiation will not be escaping to the outside plastic as much as it is while in a portable state. Let's go over and take a look at what the device looks like at 10 watt running in a portable state. As you can see, at 10 watt in a portable state, we're going to get much better battery life. We're going to be looking at closer to two and a half hours of battery life. This is something that is far better in a portable state. Also, if we take a look at how much the heat radiation is going out from this particular device, you can see that because we are making less of a demand at 10 watt TDP, we're looking at around 17 watt total. So there's 17 watts demand being pulled from the battery. At that discharge rate, the battery doesn't actually heat up as much as when it's running at 20 at 20 watt. So what we're looking at here is something that is far more comfortable to hold in the hand at 10 watt. What I'm trying to define for you is what is the optimal power ceiling to run in a portable state on the Ioneo Air 1S. Come in a little bit, I'm gonna tell you, super simple. The max you should be running it at is 13 watts. Now let me explain. At 20 watt, the device gets way too hot to be holding in your hand. It's gonna be uncomfortable. Also, you're gonna have an hour of battery life. You're gonna have fantastic performance at that wattage that's going to be really in its efficiency zone the max end of its efficiency zone at 10 watt the device runs nice and cool you're gonna get two and a half hours of battery life but this is really reserved for like indie games or games that aren't going to be stressing the hardware all that much if you're trying to get the max amount of efficiency while still playing some AAA games at 13 watt this is going to be just enough power to extract start extracting performance out of the 7840u this is where I've always said the device wakes up and this is where we start to see the performance gains like crazy. If you take a look at this video real quick, you can see the difference between going from 10 watt to 11 watt to 12 watt to 13 watt. And as soon as we hit 13 watt, our FPS really spikes up a lot. And then at 15 watt, we're actually hitting 60 FPS and HDD. So when we're taking a look at it through this lens, if you just say, well, the difference from 10 watt to 13 watt is really actually huge, but the power demand from the battery as well as also from the device itself really isn't very significant. So that's where we find that sweet spot. So that's really where it comes down to is when we're trying to thread that needle of performance, thermal radiation, and everything else for the device in a portable state. For this particular device, I would recommend 13 watts. Let's go next onto actually taking a look at thermals from the heatsink fan itself. This graph is actually super simple to look at. You can see that this two hour run, I'm running 20 watt consistently throughout. We're not really getting any dips, super stable in the entire time. If we take a look at our temps from the heatsink fan, we're basically hovering around like 72 degrees Celsius. This is an excellent result for this device. So from a perspective of cooling the device thermally from the chipset itself, we are fine to run this device at 20 watt and 25 watt. 25 watt is only gonna open up on the ISBase app when you plug it in. If you take out the plug, it's actually only gonna go up to 20 watt for you, which is a nice little touch on the ISBase app itself because going up to 25 watt is really silly on this device. It's gonna kill your battery. You're not gonna get much performance out of it in terms of diminishing returns. It's just not worth it in a portable state at all. But it can be handled 25 watt when it's plugged in. So if you wanna go that route, you also have that opportunity. So that's the thermals of the device, both how it looks externally, what types of power ceilings you should be running at at different TDPs and how that relates to the device itself as well as the internal thermal characteristics on the package itself. Let's start getting into the benchmark so you have a bigger idea of how much performance difference happens between 10, 15, and 20 watt. Let's jump into it. All right, now we're in the benchmark section just so you can get a quick idea of the type of performance that you're gonna get out of the AMD 7840U in the iNeo Air 1S. If we take a look at the iNeo Air 1S at 10 watt, we're looking at a 32.5 FPS average. Now this is Batman Arkham Knight running at 720p max settings. 
Uh, so if we take a look at the difference between 10 watt and 20 watt, we're looking at a 55% performance improvement from going from 10 watt to 20 watt. However, we're looking at a 11% per percent improvement on averages going from 10 watt to 15 watt. So not a gigantic difference between 10 and 15 watt for this particular title. Going up to 20 watt is where we're going to start seeing big performance gains. Let's go ahead and jump into the next title. The next title we're looking at is Cyberpunk 2077. This is 720p. We're using the Steam Deck preset, no upscaling whatsoever, and the FOV at 100. Now at 10 watt, you can see that we're getting a 16 FPS average. This is barely runnable, this is barely playable. However, when we go up to 15 watt, we can see we are now at a playable 34.2 FPS average. Uh, our one percentile is looking like 24.6 FPS. So this is still a playable state as our averages are pretty good. However, the performance improvement going from 10 watt to 15 watt is a 213% performance improvement. Uh, going up to 20 watt from 10 watt is a 260% performance improvement. So you can see the vast performance difference that we have between these two wattages on this particular game for the 7840U. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next game. The next game we're going to be taking a look at is Deus Ex Mankind Divided. I am running at 720p ultra settings with the DirectX 11 backend. If we take a look at 10 watt, we're looking at a measly 14.7 FPS average. This is pretty pathetic, but it is a very hard DirectX 11 game. It's one of the reasons why I love featuring it on this channel. But if we take a look at going from 10 watt to 15 watt, we can see a ginormous boost in performance. We're going to basically a 234.335% performance improvement going from 10 watt to 15 watt. So you can really see how much of a difference going from 10 watt to 15 watt makes on this device. And again, at 13 watt is where we see that fulcrum, that threshold of where the 7840U actually really opens up and the performance really starts to uh, improve, which we touched on earlier on in this video. And the difference between 10 watt and 20 watt is a 270% performance improvement. So that's where you're going to start seeing the diminishing returns as we push more power into it. We're not going to be extracting that same type of performance that we're putting into it. The 13 to 15 watt Technically, 13 to 18 watt TDP is the efficiency zone for 7840U. Also for the 6800U, that's where we're really going to extract the most amount of power. But again, at 13 watt, you're going to find that performance is going to be there in terms of getting that performance for the power you're putting into it. And that's actually an ideal zone to be using it in a portable state. Let's look at the next game. The next game we're going to be taking a look at is Horizon Zero Dawn. This is running 720p and the favorite performance preset. And I also already showed you this video, but we're going to show it again. At 10 watt, we're looking at a 29.3 FPS average. And sure enough, when we're taking a look around and zooming around here, it does look like we're getting around 30 FPS when we're in this particular state. Now, when we try to push that a little bit further, when we go up to 15 watt, we're doubling our performance. And we're actually able to show that in these performance as well. So the difference between 10 watt and 15 watt for a lot of games is going to be rather gigantic. Again, we're going to wake up that performance at 13 watt on the 7840U. And this is evident in the video, but we're gonna see what, uh, basically what it comes down to is that the difference between 10 watt and 15 watt is a 200% performance improvement for Horizon Zero Dawn with these particular settings. So you're gonna go from 30 FPS to 60 FPS, which is kind of playable to extremely playable. So this is a, a really great result. So again, at 13 watt, you're gonna start being hovering around 40 FPS, but at 15 watt, this is going to be a really sweet zone. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next game. Okay, the next game is Returnal. This is running at 720p low settings with no upscaling. And this game is just fantastically hard on GPUs. I mean, sensationally hard. This is one of my favorite benchmarks to run for a GPU bound test. This is going to stress GPUs fantastically. At 10 watt, we're running at 9.5 FPS. So this is definitely not runnable at 10 watt. At 15 watt, we basically double it. We're getting 191% performance improvement. However, it's still not playable at a 20 FPS average, basically. And we're looking at 11.3, one percentile on frames. Uh, basically, when we take a look at this game, Returnal is just too much of a game for this particular handheld. At 7840U, we have to really start pushing it more in a lot of different directions. We're really gonna have to start going into territory where we're gonna have to start really minimizing how much we're pushing to the CPU and really trying to push that GPU more but that memory bandwidth is really going to starve us for a lot there. So this is a game that is going to be showing the edge case of where we're not really going to be able to play very many games, or you're going to use have to use heavy upscaling by reducing the resolution a whole bunch. So that's it for the benchmarks here. I just wanted to make this kind of quick and concise just to kind of briefly show you guys what it was all about and more to showcase what the difference is between 10 watt, 15 watt, and 20 watt because at 10 watt, we're really choking the system, but at 13 watt is when it starts to open up. 15 watt, the difference between 10 watt and 15 watt is gigantic on a lot of different games. So when you take a look at that, you say, wow, that's an explosion of power that is coming from the explosion of performance that's coming from that 
little opening of the valve on power so it's really a big performance uplift but when we start getting closer to 20 watt you can see that we're going to start having diminishing returns so 13 to 18 watt again is the sweet spot for 7840u which is also where the 6800u finds itself pushing more power you're not going to be extracting any real performance out of that you're just going to be wasting power so that's pretty much it we're going to start talking about the last parts of this review are things that i would say are caveats and things to look out for on the ioneo air 1s where it might not really be for you but let's go ahead and get into it Let's do a quick review on the controls of the INEO Air 1S. Now, once again, we find that the INEO team is sticking to tradition where they're using memory-based D-pads and face buttons. Now, very briefly, let's talk about these face buttons. Uh, they are absolutely sensational. Now, for face buttons, I don't really care if they're dome-based micro-release switches or membrane-based. I just only care that they are tactile and that they're understood with very little fatigue in pressing them. You can see how easy it is for me to roll over on these face buttons. They're super crunchy. The feedback is absolutely excellent. I absolutely love INEO's face buttons. Now for a D-pad, I am biased towards a dome-based uh, D-pad. This is something that the Vita, the Sony PS Vita, first debuted with that was really sensational. Now they are sticking with tradition. As far as it's concerned, it's still an excellent D-pad. You can depress in the center, but when you do, not all four of them are depressed. Only two directions will be pressed at any given moment. Now, overall, this D-pad is really good, but I would only give it a B-plus rating. The best membrane-based D-pad that I've ever used was made by the manufacturer 8BitDo, which they make Bluetooth controllers. Those guys really nailed membrane-based D-pads. That's not to say that this isn't very good. I just say that that is my top tier. That is my ceiling for quality on membrane-based D-pads, and they find themselves a little bit under there. But overall, super serviceable. Now let's start talking about the analog sticks themselves. So there are a few things that we need to talk about here. Let me get into here so we can see. The INEO team just absolutely loves making these uh, having complete circularity. Now we can actually change that a bit and I'll go into some testing there in a second. But you can see by default we are going to have a bit of a dead zone and we're going to have this complete circularity. So you can just have this average error that you see right here. Now if you want to change this we're going to go ahead and jump into ISP. So I'm going to go ahead and press the I button right here. I'm going to hold it down because we want to jump in here. So now we're going to go into joystick. Now I've already gone into the settings. Let me just back out of here so you can see how you get to there. So I'm going to go over to the hamburger and I'm going to go to the settings and we're going to go all the way down and we're going to go to controller and then we're going to go to joystick, which we find ourselves right there. Now you can see sensitivity. We're going to go ahead and push that up to 150%. So if we go back here, we're going to see that we can now go over that sensitivity. So this is something that is in the IS space 2 that I initially missed, but this is a huge deal. And you can actually change this per analog stick. So if you just want on one side versus the other, you have that feature and functionality where you can make more of a full square on the IS space app. More to the point, if we go over here, we can see that if I just push in just a little bit, we're going to see that the dead zone pops out quite a bit. Now, if you want to change that, you can actually do that as well. So you're going to go into dead zone. You're going to change that to off. Now, if we go here, now you're going to see that there is no dead zone and pushing just a little bit. We can actually all already have sensitivity on there. However, I have found that when I am using this, that it will offset itself a bit uh, so there might need to be some calibration that's used in the IS Space app itself to try to really fine tune that. What I would love to see is the IA team themselves have some granularity with regard to how big or small we can make a dead zone. And I think that's going to be something that we're going to find ourselves uh, finding in terms of a user appreciable manner that people are going to find themselves liking it. But you can totally control it yourself if you want to completely disable the dead zone or have a dead zone on or off. So this is really nice to see on the ISBase app and having that feature and functionality. Overall, because we have complete control over the analog sticks now, this is something that I find to be absolutely fantastic and the INEO team deserves a lot of credit here for giving the user so much features and functionality that you're going to be able to find on there and everyone is going to be able to fine tune their analog sticks exactly as they want. Also these analog sticks are outrageously good so if we take a look and we try to move them around we can see we have absolute fidelity overall no magnetism whatsoever this is Excellent. So we find very small analog sticks that are on the INEO Air, Air 1S. 
Uh, overall, I think that they're fantastic, and you can tune these up to however you want. You can also go into less sensitivity. So on the left stick, we're going to make it 50%. So now you're going to see that we can only push up so much. Now, I don't know why anyone would want this. Perhaps there's something that makes this worthwhile. Let me know in the comment section if you know what that's about. Finishing it off, we have some additional buttons. So we have LC and RC over here. We can actually tune that up in IS space as well. Let's go ahead and jump into that. So here in the same settings where you saw the analog stick at the top, we can go to custom shoulder key. Now, this is something that I've been asking for a while, but it still doesn't seem like it's working all that great. So you can see that we have key combination. Now, this is something that I just want to press a keyboard key. So we're going to go in here and press Y to enter. And in here, you can see that I've entered T. So if you just go over here, right, and you highlight that, you can bring up a virtual keyboard and you can say, I want to make this another letter. So we made it D right now, right? So we're going to go ahead and close this and we're going to say start, save. Great. So now I have short press for LC should be pressing the D key. However, when we're in something like notepad over here, when I go here and I press this, you can see it's not working. I tried restarting the iSpace app afterwards. So it's feature and functionality seems like it's there, but it's probably just needing a few more updates before that's working. But I'm glad that the I Neo team finally implemented that feature because that's been a long requested feature for me. So that's good to see. And hopefully just for updates, we can actually get that corrected. But right now you can actually have just a few uh, built in presets for this, where you can bring up like the task manager, if you hold it down or you bring it up, you can see that that will be the task bar. So there's different types of functionality by just short pressing or long press. You can see long press brought up task manager so you can easily bring up that. So those are the additional buttons that are LC and RC something that is from the iSpace app. Uh, along the top, we also have a nice fingerprint reader that also doubles as our power button. And then we have what I actually consider really good analog sticks. I actually like these analog sticks much more than the iNeo 2S, for example. So that's a very brief review on the controls on the iNeo Air 1S overall for its package and what's on offer. Really, truly excellent. The iNeo Air 1S actually finds itself in a really good position, to be honest. What we're going to see here is that we have a very small device that has whole based analog sticks, whole based triggers, and OLED screen on a very small Small device. There are some things that I would say are a negative, and we'll talk about those in just a moment, but everything that the INAO team did to upgrade the old air model, they really did a great job. They pushed in the latest and greatest AMD 7840U package that's in here. This is nothing more that you can particularly ask for at this point in time. Additionally, all the little hard edges were rounded off. The iSpace 2 app works fantastic on this device. Now, the only thing I do want to mention is this OLED screen does use PWM or a pulse width modulation to fluctuate the brightness of the screen itself. So if the panel is at 100%, you won't notice any PWM at all. So if you were susceptible to PWM, basically that means that you're going to have to run this device at 100% brightness. And even at 100% brightness, it really doesn't get super bright. So you're still kind of in a nice area. It's around 350 nits is what INEO team says itself. So if you were looking at it from that angle, you could avoid PWM strain by just pushing at 100% brightness. However, if, if you are susceptible to that, that is something that you're going to have to navigate here. For me, I am not susceptible to it, and I really appreciate the punch that the OLED screen has. That contrast and how vivid it is, it is absolutely fantastic. The other thing that I would say is a negative, not really a negative, is a, a model to avoid is the thinner model. That is a model that is going to have a smaller battery, also, that thin device, because it is so thin, that heat radiation is going to spread out to that device much, much easier. You're going to have an overall worse time with it, not only from trying to push it to really low power, but it's just not really worth it considering the price difference when going to the regular model, which has a 30 watt, 38 watt hour battery and has more plastic area to dissipate that heat into. Overall, I just would completely avoid that thinner model and just get the regular model. So that's just a personal recommendation for me. The last bit that I want to talk about is that the iSpace 2 app is still getting updated and there are still some hard edges that need to be rounded off. Specifically, like I mentioned in my control review in this particular review is that uh, the LC and RC function, which they have added the feature that I've been asking for forever now is being able to have like keyboard keys. While it's there and present, I it's not working for me. So this is most likely an app update away before that's fixed. So I don't think that that's a big deal because that's a software problem and that can be fixed. So overall, it's really fantastic. The only thing that I would say is avoid the thin model because you only want the 38 watt hour battery. That's a personal recommendation for myself. And the other thing is, is if you are susceptible to a PWM that is on OLED, if this would be on phones as well. So you would have probably already seen this already. This one may be a factor for you. However, at full brightness, it's not super bright as it is. 
So chances are you could actually still run at 100 percent brightness. That's it for me on the INEO Air 1S. It is a fantastic small device. I think that this is a fantastic space for the INEO team to be in because they can be unique in this space, offering a small device with OLED. They're the only company that does it. So if that is something that you really want, it's a fantastic device. That's it for me, guys. I hope this was informative. As always, thank you for your time and thanks for watching.